We are in Galatians chapter 4, and we're halfway through that section as Galatians is just divided up. The first couple of chapters primarily dealing with Paul's defense of his apostleship, the genuineness of the gospel that he preached, that was given to him by direct revelation of God, Christ. And uh, then chapters 3 and 4 generally describe a lot of ways, but generally considered to be doctrinal section of the gospel. Where Paul uh, discusses heavily the inability of the old law to save and justify, um, and the fact that it was always meant uh, to be a temporary. measure on the part of God to get us to the faith, the gospel system, that is, to the blood of Christ. And all men under every dispensation that are forgiven their sins are not forgiven the fruit of one Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> this discussion applies not only to the law of Moses, but in any <clears throat> law-keeping system whereby men would think that they can obtain their salvation merely by keeping Law, because the law can only do one thing, and that's condemn. Uh, and so <clears throat> the law is described in various ways. Law keeping is described in various ways in this book, but generally it's, we'll see, it's considered to be bondage. Uh, and it's bondage because it's frustrating, and there's really no way to get to where you want to go. Um, whereas the gospel system is described as on of liberty and freedom. Not freedom or liberty to sin and license, um, but because of what it's freed us from. And lest we think that this discussion is not applicable to us today, obviously it mattered to these people because these Gentile Christians were being uh, drawn away from the simple gospel of Jesus Christ by these Judaizing teachers. He wanted them to, to keep elements of the law of Moses um, and, and kind of merge that in with the gospel. And Paul says the two are not compatible <clears throat> at all. One's been done away by the other. It's been replaced, fulfilled uh, by Christ. <clears throat> but lest you think that that's a, this is an academic exercise, there are at least three major religions in that, as far as I know, claim if not hundreds of millions, billions of adherents who are that are based on law-keeping types of systems. Uh, what are they? Anybody know? What are they? That is the idea that that somehow the way life works is is I perform enough good deeds. And they outweigh my bad deeds, and that will get me to heaven or whatever my particular belief system says I'm going. Hinduism is one. Buddhist to a certain extent. Islam. Catholicism. And all of those religions have enslaved billions of people. Um, those guys that uh, flew those planes into the World Trade Center. Do you know what they, many of them did the night before? Huh? They partied. They went to a strip bar. How could they do that? Because they were going to redeem themselves by killing them. Absolutely, because the good deeds were going to outweigh the bad. It's just a matter of ledger keeping. So, and that, and if you if they did it, did then Allah, the God of Islam, just simply overlooks that. There's no such thing as the redeeming blood of Christ. There's, there is no mechanism for cleansing of sin so that we can stand before a holy God. And so, all these systems are work works based, law keeping systems. And so, the discussion is important. So let's pick up there in chapter 4 and we, we 
read this first section last week. Now I say that the heir, go back to chapter 3, if you're a Christ and you're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Not just one who's a Jew fleshly or physically. If you want to be the son of Abraham, an heir according to promise. As long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. How so? And I, even in our modern day society, if you die with a will that leaves property to a minor, does the minor get control of it? No. You either have to leave it in a trust, or if you don't, somebody's going to have to set up a court appointment. Sorry, uh, sorry. Somebody to be in charge of that minor's property and stay and manage it until the minor can reach his adulthood. That's why you don't ever put a minor, for those of you that are in here with children, don't ever put a minor as a beneficiary on your insurance policy. Again, you've just set yourself up for that you're going to have to have a court appointed guardianship because an insurance company will not pay the insurance proceeds to anybody but a court appointed guardian unless you set up a trust or something else they can pay. But they're not going to write a check to somebody that's 12 years old. So, he's like a slave. Even though he's master of all, potentially he's got it all, but he's not in charge. He's under, the New King James says, guardians and stewards. Those are good translations. He has a guardian of the person, and he has a manager for his estate, that is, his property. Until the time, now notice there's there's a time frame, until the time appointed by the father, whenever the father says he can have it. It's going to be 18 in this country unless you set up a trust that says different. It says, no, it's going to be 21 or 25 or whatever. All the day. But until the time appointed by the father. Well, these Jews that were under the old law, the faithful Jew who was an heir, the whole time they were under the law of Moses. The whole time. They were under guardianship and stewardship. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem by back those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir of God through Christ. And so, he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Remember, go back and talk about that pedo, Gagos, the one who was leading, the little boy leader, leading them to uh, school until the time of the day. That's the same thing until... time appointed by the Father is the same thing as the fullness of time we see there in verse 4 that we're going to talk about. But again, it was considered bondage because of the law-keeping system that they were under. No justification, only condemnation under such a system. Uh, and of course, you see this phrase, the elements of the world, that uh, somewhat translated elemental things, kind of like the ABC. You see? Right. And so both Jews and Gentiles, frankly, in their own way, had tried to achieve salvation through whatever law keeping system they had. The Jews had the law of Moses, the Gentiles had all kinds of pagan systems. Just like they do now. Just like we do now. Just like the religions we just mentioned. But let's talk about verse four. It's always an interesting verse to me. When the fullness of the time had come. Notice God sent forth His Son. Jesus Christ did not come into existence as a physical birth. God sent Him forth. He's deity. And I suppose He could have come into this world in another way, but He didn't. He came through a virgin birth, born of a woman. Why? Because He had to do what? He had to experience what? Yeah, absolutely. He had to be human like us in order to die in our place. And so, virgin birth, born of a woman. 
So he's both divine. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, and he's human too. I'm born under the law. He lived under the law of Moses, Christ did. And he kept it perfectly in order that he could redeem us, buy us back, all those that were under the law, that they could be adopted as sons. But the fullness of time. Alright, let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about this image. Right? And there's four great world empires, and they were already living, Daniel was already living under the reign of those. Who was the head of gold? Babylon. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon. What did the Babylonian period, that empire, contribute to the fullness of time? The Jews were taken off in the Babylonian captivity. The southern tribes were. What did they develop during that time? Synagogue worship. Synagogue. Was synagogue worship important to the fullness of time? In two ways. What are the two ways? First of all, Jews throughout these empires, these four different empires, have been scattered all over the world. Take them one. The Old Testament Scripture. So now synagogues are scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Where did Paul go first? Always went to the synagogue. But really more important than that, I mean, Paul could have stood anywhere for each, and he did sometimes. Yeah, but they gave him a place to preach to people that were already familiar with what was going on. That's true. But more important than that, what did the synagogue give the New Testament church? A pattern for worship. Absolutely. Did you know there's only one difference in our worship and synagogue worship? Communion. That's it. Acapella singing in synagogue. Each synagogue was led by a group of men called Catches. elders. Right. Prayer, reading of scripture, sermon, everything that we have. <coughs> Babylonian Empire contributed to the fullness of the time. What did the Persians contribute? What did they add for the world that made it more stable? Law. law. You know, up until that time, who was the law? We like to say, we like to throw out this phrase, nobody's talking the law. Well, usually the people that say that believe they are. But, <clears throat> theoretically, under our Constitution, that's true. Um, and we hope it's true. But before the Persian Empire, who was the law in any given nation? Huh? The monarch was. He was absolute. Killed who he wanted to kill. Saved alive who he wanted to save alive. Treated who he wanted to treat well. Treated who he wanted to treat bad. You just hoped you had a good king, a good monarch, who had some sense of justice and fairness. But after the Persians, remember, even Darius couldn't change his own law, right? He gave that decree regarding Daniel and, and prayer, and he couldn't change his own decree. He doesn't change it. Remember in the book of Esther, the, the decree went out to kill the Jews. They didn't change that. They didn't say, no, you're not going to kill the Jews. They just sent out another law that says the Jews can get together and defend themselves. So, what about, what came next? This is the easy one. This is the easiest one of all. Yeah, the Greeks, what did they give to the fullness of time? Yeah, the most precise language the world has ever known. One in Greek, which our New Testament was written in. So, then we come to the Romans. Stability, communication, Roads, common travel, common language. Everything perfect for the scattering of the gospel. And so, while they were a very harsh group of people and rulers, nevertheless, it was a very stable time for that part of the world. 
fullness of time, just the right time. I mean, how long did it take him to come? How long did it take Christ to get here? Four thousand. Yeah, at least, right? Conservatively speaking, give or take a thousand or two. But ever since Genesis chapter three, right? God gave that promise. So, fullness of time. All of that done, He was sent forth of a virgin, God in the flesh, to buy us back, to redeem those who were under the law, and notice to give us adoption as sons. I don't know if you could think of a greater blessing than that. To be adopted by the God of the universe. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He were rich, yet for your sake He became poor, that you through His poverty might what? Might become rich. We've been adopted by the richest being in the universe. We've been adopted by the one who owns the universe. <laughs> And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. Well, there's always more than one position on these kinds of verses when you talk about the Spirit. Certainly, if you are of the persuasion that uh, you believe in the literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that's what you're going to see when you read this verse. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, I have a Father. Well, of course, again, um, I always get back to that question. What would that have meant for me? I mean, couldn't a false teacher say the same thing? For a literal, indwelling, non miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit, which you really don't know is there or not. Unless you believe he's actually talking to you. <laughs> Some do. But again, if we go back to chapter 3. We know when he was talking about the Spirit in chapter 3, what, in what context was he using those passages? If you go back to chapter 3, verse 2 and verse 5, what was he talking about? Not the, some literal non miraculous indwelling, but what? Yeah, miraculous gifts. Miraculous gifts. And so it seemed to me that that would fit this context as well. These people receive the miraculous ability to perform various miracles. Which proved number one, as Paul goes back into chapter three, the superiority of the gospel over the law of Moses. They didn't get that under the law. But what else does it prove? Where did they get those gifts? Who imparted them? And specifically, Paul probably. So again, it goes back to his the genuineness of his apostleship and of the message that he preached, the fact that he was able to impart these gifts to them. Um, and if they would think back to that, then they wouldn't be so eager to go chasing them after these Judaizing teachers, which couldn't impart them anything. They gave them nothing, and the law gave them. He says, he, yeah. Yeah, and I always go back to the parallel passages of Colossians and Ephesians. The one passage says, that talks about the Spirit dwelling within you, the other one says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. But then he says, it, he sent it into your hearts crying out, Abba, Father. Well, there's a couple of different ways you can read that grammatically, I guess. It's a term, Abba, anyway. What is that? Oh. Yeah, it's more than just saying Father, though, in a formal way. It's a more endearing term. In fact, uh, I think it was uh, one writer that said that uh, Something about uh, slaves were not allowed to use that term for their master. Children, could, only children could use that term. 
Um, but it's an endearing term, but, but don't miss the point that it's not only an endearing term, but in the Arabic, but it's, uh, it's also a respectful term at the same time. And so sometimes people in, in English have, have uh, said, well, I'll just call it daddy. daddy yeah. That's not the same thing at all. It doesn't show the same respect uh, that this term does in its, in its language. But he talks about the spirit or somebody's crying out. And, and you can again look at that two different ways. Some read the package that the Spirit is crying out, and I suppose that could be consistent with... Uh, um, we have those passages that talk about the Spirit being on what? He knows. Helps us in our prayer. Where is the Spirit? Though? He's still in heaven. He's interceding for us. On the other hand, uh, it could be that He's talking about us crying out here. Abba Father, and because of that, because of our new relationship, this being adopted as sons, then He has poured forth His Spirit. He has given His Spirit. He has distributed these, these gifts. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You're not under that old law. You're not in bondage anymore. But you're a son. And if a son, then you're an heir. God through Christ. We get all those blessings of being, and we talk about the church as being a what? We are the what of God. We're the family of God. In fact, that's why we use familial terms. Christ the elder brother, and you're my brothers, and you're my sisters. God is our Father. Because we're in a family. We've been adopted in this family. We've been born in it, right? Born into the family of God through our baptisms. And so we are heirs. And if I'm an heir, then that means I'm going to receive what those Abrahamic promises, right? But I have to be a son to be an heir. Let's pick up at verse 8. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God. Now it seems to me he's directing his attention to who? Gentiles. Yeah. After all, these are the ones that are being wooed by the Judaizing teachers. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you would desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you lest I have labored for you in vain. So, talking about Gentiles, those with a Hebrew background, they were in bondage before. Whatever system, whatever form of worship, whatever pagan system they were following. But they had been freed by the gospel of Christ. They had become heirs, sons of God. But back before, they didn't know God. Idols are not, which by nature are not gods. They worshiped idols, right? And now they know God. And that's important. It's important to know God. Well, what's more important here? I mean, this is a, I mean, think about this passage. Now after you have known God, or rather, or what? Known by God. And that's a important question. Am I known by God? Does He know me? And when I, we use the word known there, no, we're not just talking about simple knowledge. We're talking about uh, uh, intimate, personal relationship. But he knows that about everybody. That's just knowledge. But to be known by him is to be in his family. To have that relationship with him. So... It's important that we know Him. It's actually more important that He knows us. And so we ask the question, so how are you turning back to those weak and beggarly elements? You're going back to what? 
And it's interesting. They're not going back to their pagan, necessarily, their pagan roots. They're going to what? Yeah, that's what he's talking about. They're, they're trying to go, go to the old law. They're going backwards to the weak and beggarly elements. Why would you do that? Why would you want to go back into bondage? That doesn't have the power to save you. You observe days. Now that's Judaism to a T right there. Verse 10. You observe days and months and seasons and years. You go back to the old law. And they had offerings every day, morning and night, morning and evening. Then they had extra additional offerings on the Sabbath. Then they had additional offerings on the first of the month. And on and on go. And every special feast day. So, all kinds of things. I mean, can't you see the, the. And you see that amalgamation of the old law and paganism. You see a lot of that in Catholicism special priesthood, wearing a special garb, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And all these rituals. But he says, um, why are you doing that? How is it your... And, and look, look, look at the phraseology he uses. To which you desire. To which you desire again to be involved. That kind of a, then a commentary on any time we sin and stray from God is because of what? It's because of our own desire. We desire, we want to do what we want to do rather than what God wants. And we have to be careful by keeping our own desires in check. Tom points out in Hebrews chapter 11 at the end of that chapter as he's bringing it to a close, he says those people, all those people that lived under prior dispensations whether it was the Mosaic law or even from the picture of Abraham who lived before the Mosaic law all of those people were not made perfect or complete without us. What he means without the gospel system. It took the blood of Christ to forgive everybody that he lived before Christ came. And there's anybody that comes out. And so then the question becomes, that being the case, why would you go back to that? And you go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, saying we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Go to passages like, uh, you know, uh, looking down the stream of time, angels desire to look into those things. Look into that marvelous plan that God had set in motion for thousands of years. And so these people, I mean, he's just, he's just again beating home the point. These, these things don't mix. And I am afraid for you, he says, lest I have labored for you. I think... Maybe the American Standard, I don't know about the King James says, I'm afraid of you. Really, I'm afraid for you is probably a better translation. I am afraid for you. He's afraid for them personally, for their souls. He's concerned about their souls. But he's also concerned about his own. Well, Paul, how much time and effort did you put into these people? Put in a lot. You ever like to see your work go down and drain? You ever done something, work somewhere, and the guy comes in after you and just it all goes to pot? Let's it all go, tears it down. Preachers see that, don't you? Sometimes. Preacher labors for years at a congregation, building it up, doing a good work, the next guy comes in after him and does something, either tears it up, lazy, whatever. 
Nobody likes to see their work dismount. So he makes a personal appeal here in verses 12 through 20. Hey, Brother Fred, this is a mundane, uh, secular thing, but there's a guy, heads up and not fit, not very far from him. One reason he won't retire, because innately he don't want to see all that he built <laughs> destroyed. Yeah. That's an understandable feeling. You think about people that have built things that we admire, have accomplished a lot. You think about a whether you like Walmart or not, think about Sam Walton and what he built. I wonder if he ever got up, woke up in the middle of the night thinking, now what's going to happen with this? <laughs> I don't know, maybe he had a lot of confidence in his children, you know, he divided it up among several of them. But, absolutely. Somebody comes in and buys out a company. Yeah. Now, if the smart ones usually, if they buy a small company, they'll ask the owner, the one they bought it from, to stay on for a while yeah. for the transition. But eventually, he's gone. But it happens. It happens in the secular world. It happens in the spiritual world. Brethren, verse 12, I urge you to become like me. <coughs> for I became like you. He starts reflecting upon his past experience with the Galatians. You have not injured me at all. Paul says, look, what he says is, what's been the tone of this letter? Go back to the beginning. What did we say that was, un that was unique and unusual about this letter from the very beginning? There was no greeting. There was a greeting, but there was no word of what? Commendation. No commendation, no praise, this letter has been tough from the start. I mean, these people got a problem. Paul's pretty, the Holy Spirit and Paul pretty been out of shape about it. And he's been he's been punching them in the face now for into the fourth chapter. And it seems at this point he's decided, you know, let me explain here. I'm not. This, I'm not doing this because I'm vengeful or I'm mad at you. Because you injured me and I'm trying to get back at you. That's not what this is about. I mean, look at look at our past together. Look, look how all this, this came about. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Apparently, whatever physical infirmity Paul had, whether it was an illness or an affliction of whatever he had when he first preached to these people, it was the kind that, that could have been somewhat uh, repulsive. They could, they could look like, and if they rejected him and his person, then that means they would have also rejected one. Yeah, the message too. But you receive me as an angel of God. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Now we've talked about that could be just a figure of speech. Some have also speculated when you pair that with other passages like writing yeah. with large letters. Perhaps he did have an eyesight issue. I'll tell you another passage you might think about that I've never thought about until I've read it somewhere about Paul's eyesight. Go back to his when he stood before the high priest and he made some harsh comment about the high priest back in the back. Somebody had to tell him what? He's the high priest. But he was also the yeah, but that's not the same context. That's that's not. Yeah, I understand, but uh, yeah, he was blind for three days, but but he got his sight back. Right? But what I'm saying is, some have thought by reading that passage where he does he doesn't recognize the high priest. Some have even speculated that. Well, he didn't have good. I mean, his, his eyes were blurry. I mean, he didn't have good eyesight. 
Somebody to tell him, that's the high priest. He said, oh, I'm sorry. He apologized. I said, I didn't know he was the high priest. He said, you know, the, the Old Testament says, don't speak evil of a ruler of my people. I don't know. It's just interesting. I don't know what this particular infirmity was. But it didn't bother them. They didn't let that come between them and the message or Paul. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And that's written with a question mark. And that's an interesting discussion too. Um, so, I don't know what the infirmity was. Sir William Ramsey, you know, who did all that archaeological work and study from the book of Luke, he wrote in St. Paul the Traveler in his commentary on Galatians that he thought Paul's particular affliction was chronic malaria. Yeah. And here's, here's, here was his position. That actually, see the King James says that, that, he, that through this physical infirmity, uh, some translations like the New King James says because of there is some speculation that perhaps Paul meant to go somewhere else in this journey. That, that Galatians was not his intended stop. So I don't know. These are not things to get bogged down. I'm just throwing out some interesting But I like what this, this is kind of interesting to me that Ramsey suggests that he had a severe attack of malaria in the low swampy sea coast of Pamphylia so he told Barnabas he'd have to move to the mountains. So instead of evangelizing in Pamphylia, they climbed to the higher altitudes to the interior province of Galatia. That's his theory. That maybe his infirmity, his illness, is what caused him to end up in Galatia. I don't know. Now, if you read it, you know that through physical infirmity, I preach the gospel. Well, that just means I had the physical infirmity and I... I just preached my way through it. it isn't, in other words, it didn't hinder me. If you read it because of, well then that there's speculation on it. Perhaps there was something there that caused him to be there because of his sickness. That's where he ended up staying. But if you read it through, if the translation is more properly through, then it just means, well, I, I was able to. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't hinder me from my work. That's all kind of interesting stuff. Nothing, nothing to get sideways about. But the bottom line, what's the point? The point is, look, I had this affliction. I preached. You could have rejected me. You didn't. You accepted me anyway, and you accepted the message. I mean, that's the point. We, at that point, we, we were together. You considered me an angel of God. And we don't always grasp, I guess, the, the pagan outlook. But you know, if they saw somebody, you remember Julius Caesar had what? Epilepsy. If you had epilepsy, you were considered to be favored by the gods. And if you had other illnesses, you were kind of looked down upon like that was God's, the, the God's displeasure upon you. If you received people still think they have pretty in fact, the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? So, Paul says, you didn't treat me that way. But this is all interesting. In Earl's New Testament word studies on verse 16, he has question or exclamation. One of the problems connected with translating the New Testament is that the early Greek manuscripts have no punctuation marks. Furthermore, the indicative mood is used for both questions and assertions. So the only way one can decide whether a sentence is interrogative or declarative is by the context. And that's not always easy. And verse 16 is one of those instances. In most or many English versions, it's translated as a question, just like in mine. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Paul's asking a rhetorical question. Martin, another commentator, prefers to read it like this with an exclamation point. So, I've become your enemy for telling you the truth. Well, that's kind of sarcastic. Yes. Either way, it would work. He could, be saying a he could be asking a rhetorical question, so I've become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth. Or so, 
I've become your enemy? Because I'm telling you the truth. Either way, what's the point? Proverbs 27, 6, right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. If somebody really cares about you, cares about your soul, we care about people and their souls, we're going to do what? We're going to tell them what they want to hear all the time? Yeah, and that doesn't mean we beat them on the head, right? Most people want to hear smooth things. But if we care about them, we've got to tell them the truth. Yep. Is the point. And that's Paul's point here. Look. And if it's a rhetorical question, then the answer obviously is what? No. no. I'm not your enemy. Your real enemies are these Judaizing teachers that are trying to pull you away. He goes into that beginning in verse 17 about how they zealously court you. You know what? Paul would have not had a problem. <laughs> he says, and, and that'll have to wait for next week. He says it's good to be zealous in a good thing. Paul was zealous for them in a good way. He wanted what was best for them. And you know what? If those Judaizing teachers had been faithful gospel preachers that had come in there and were working and building upon what Paul had established, Paul wouldn't have had any problem. He would have been jealous of them. He would have been happy that there was somebody there looking out for those people at that point. But that's not what the Judaizing teacher wanted. They wanted these people for something else. And you'll have to talk about that. Brother Tom. I'm going to be out of time. All right.